Good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, for joining us today. My name is Praveen Jadav. I'll be hosting October edition of Wipro's Reimagining Re R&D webinar series. Today we'll be discussing Reimagining re Oncology Drug Development with Dose Optimization with one of the leaders from Office of Clinical Pharmacology at FDA, uh, Dr. Landry Okisania. Before I formally introduce Dr. Okisania, let me give you some housekeeping notes. Today's webinar is recorded. Um, I invite your comments and questions. To post your comments and questions, um, you can look at the chat box on your screen. Uh, mostly it will be on the right hand side. If you have any technical issues or experiencing any difficulties, please reach out to Holly, holly at wipro.ai. She'll be able to help you. We'll also appreciate a, your feedback by answering a short poll at the end of this webinar, including we'll announce our November webinar uh, uh, speaker. So stay tuned for that if you do miss it uh, um, for, for future announcements. To get right to it, uh, before um, uh, I formally introduce our speaker, uh, well, hopefully, you'll hear uh, history and current status of Project Optimus today, its importance and role of dose op optimization uh, for oncology products in regula regulatory decision-making. And you'll also hear about how modeling plays role and re its relationship with Project Optimus. And we'll hear uh, some case studies on how sponsors are responding and as well as can prepare for Project Optimus. Why is this topic important to us? This is an interesting slide uh, our engineers pulled up uh, using the database we have at uh, Wipro. Uh, if you look at the uh, time period between 2008 um, up until 2015 or so, um, of all the PMRs that were ever requested by FDA, somewhere between 20 to 25% had dose-related component. That number had jumped to about 25 to 35%, again, depending on what gets approved, which year gets approved. Uh, so this topic is, has become um, more, more important, and you'll hear specific case studies uh, from our speaker today. So without further delay, let me introduce Dr. Landre Okusania from Office of Clinical Pharmacology at FDA. He's a deputy, deputy division director for the Division of Cancer Pharmacology in, in the Office of Clinical Pharmacology at FDA. Dr. Okusania received his pharmacy degree from Texas Southern University, completed a pharmacy practice residency at the University of Pittsburgh, and a Pfizer University of Buffalo Drug Development Fellowship with Masters in Pharmacometrics from Sunny Buffalo. He has been involved in the review and approval of multiple anti-cancer therapies with an emphasis on drugs to treat malignant and non-malignant hematology diseases, including biosimilars, and identifying and addressing regulatory issues that arise in oncology drug development from a clinical pharmacology perspective. Prior to joining FDA, his work included leveraging preclinical and early human data for dose selection, optimizing dosing regimens for patients, as well as providing transnational and investigational PKPD guidance for the development of novel therapeutics. Dr. Okusania, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, and I will hand over to you for uh, your presentation, and then we'll engage uh, in, in Q&A with, uh, with you. So welcome. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Pravin. Um, first of all, um, before I get to find to the presentation, I'd like to wish um, to all who celebrate Happy Diwali. Um, I have no conflicts to disclose, and um, the, this talk represents my views and opinions. I should not be construed uh, to represent the FDA's uh, views or policies. Now, you know, in oncology, we've approved a number of novel therapies, as you can see over the last 10 years. And however, highlighted in red, a few of the drugs that, you, that we've noted have had, have had um, dosing issues. Um, and because of that, you know, there's a new project you know, within the Oncology Center of Excellence called Project Optimus, 
And why is that? You know, Project Optimus was launched in 2021 with a mission to ensure that cancer drugs are optimized to maximize efficacy as well as safety and tolerability. This mission is taken very seriously by the FDA and includes a multidisciplinary team of medical oncologists, clinical pharmacologists, biostatisticians, toxicologists, um, and other scientists, scientists with expertise in key facets of uh, dose optimization. Now, the specific goals of Project Optimus are listed here, uh, but I want to highlight the bullet that you can see in bold, which is, you know, to develop strategies for dose finding and dose optimization that leverages non-clinical and clinical data in, in dose selection. And, and that, I think, is something that clinical pharmacology plays a very large role in. Now, um, dose optimization is not new to clinical pharmacology, and it's really consistent with our vision and our mission. You know, some may call it our um, peanut butter and jelly, um, uh, so, so to speak. And this is kind of sort of highlighted in a quote by uh, Dr. Larry Lesko in around 2005, showing how old um, this has this thinking has been within the Office of Clinical Pharmacology, the right dose for the, the right drug for the right patient at the right time. So what has changed? Uh, why now, particularly in oncology? Well, you know, if we step back a little bit, you know, we can we look at oncology drug development and we can find that, you know, if you look back to the early 30s and early 40s when we started uh, figuring out the best way to treat patients, uh, we started now with something that's ridiculously toxic, nitrogen mustard, uh, which was used to treat Hodgkin's disease or um, some malignant hematologic diseases. Well, what did that do? That transitioned us into a new phase of drug development, particularly in oncology, where we were looking at, you know, drugs that phase, you know, cell phase cycle drugs. You know, we had a number of taxins, you know, we have pinker alkaloids, we have some phase non-specific agents. Um, and we can see, you know, from nitrogen mustard, drug development kind of sort of grew a little bit slowly up until the 2000s. Now, this is highlighted, you know, in even on to, and this is highlighted with this figure, which I which I found in a textbook, Applied Therapeutics by Cody Kimball. The clinical use of drugs that focused, that talked about a chapter on oncology drug products, and seventh edition published as late as 2001. Uh, indicating these are the kind of drugs that we had available for therapy at, at that time. And you can see that there's really, you know, a number of handfuls, so to speak. But in the 2000s, you know, we had a plethora of new drugs, you know, show up. Now, this is a fairly busy slide, so I would um, encourage you not to pay too much attention to the specifics with, within each box. But the thing is, it really just highlights, you know, the, the growth of oncology drugs that, that, it, that ended up being approved. We have them growing from 2001 all the way to 2020, and a number of these drugs are targeted therapies. So, as we can see, you know, we have a, sh a gradual shift from, you know, in, ca in, in, uh, in cancer therapies, you know, a gradual shift from cytotoxic chemotherapies all the way to targeted therapies or molecular targeted agents. And given the needs and given the issues that we were running, to, that we ran into, you know, back in the olden days, so to speak, you know, the MTD approach, it achieved a specific goal at its time, you know. Um, but one thing that I also ended up is that we had a loss of information to make better dose of decision. And as such, you know, there's a, def you know, once you have that lack of information, you know, it leads to scientific and commercial issues. And, if, and one thing that we've learned, you know, over the course of drug development over the last few years is that the MTD is not necessarily the optimal dose. Now, you know, we can might say that, yeah, that's great for us targeted therapies, but even for cytotoxic agents, we found that even high exposures can lead to more toxicities with no additional efficacy benefits. And adequate dose finding just really does help us um, achieve an effective dose with no unnecessary increase in toxicities. We've seen examples of this where lower doses, you know, for cytotoxic drugs have even been shown to be as effective or with, you know, no unnecessary increase in toxicities. And you can see that 
manifesting in you know patient quality of life in some instances even um improved overall survival and the like now, our, our traditional dosing strategy, which is which really just gets us to the MTD approach, is you know a three plus three approach where you have you know three patients in, uh, enrolled at a low dose. You know, after those three patients, you escalate another three patients, and after that, you, you, you keep escalating with three patients until you identify those limiting toxicity. Now, the challenge that you run into that is that is really this you know, you have very few patients evaluated at each dose. Uh, many times, a lot of these first in human studies look at multiple indications, they look at the sick schedule, they have very short observation periods for the dose limited toxicities and there's limited emphasis there's a lot of emphasis on the dose limiting toxicities and not necessarily on the um, other safety measures that are of concern to patients in addition to that you have very limited use of the pd um, endpoints or biomarkers and very limited exposure response analysis What does that look like? Or what does that really mean? You know, you're going into a registrational trial, um, given that it's an oncology drug, uh, with very limited information to identify an appropriate dose. You really just have six patients here, um, which is what you consider to MTT that you're comparing against control. And what does that really mean? Or what does that end up looking like? You know, if you look at the hypothetical drug here, which I have at the lower, at the lower um, box, you know, if you look at the overall response rate, I look at, for example, you know, grade events, right? You can see that five milligrams has two patients, 10 milligrams, three patients, 15 milligrams has five patients, 20 and four. And you said your response rates between all those doses are fairly similar. One might say, hey, the 10 milligrams has a numerically higher response rate um, than the than, the, than any of the higher doses, but you know this data is just based off two patients. You know, two patients out of three had a response, so that's six or percent. What does that really mean? Um, but if you look at the grade two, grade three, um, if you look at the adverse events, you can see that they're relatively all over the place, and as such. It still it emphasizes the fact that you're going into a pivotal registrational trial with very little information, other than the fact that within a um, DLT window, this uh, this is the highest dose the patient can tolerate, which is not really the, the best way to develop drugs. So what can we do? How can this really change? I, I think you know what we have to do is start leveraging a lot of information and start revamping the way we actually develop. Look at these clinical trials. And early, from early development, you have a lot of information that you get. You have PK data, which is very important. Uh, you have PD endpoints that you also get to assess. You have FK, uh, for efficacy and for activity. You have preliminary dose and exposure safety activity um, relationship that you're able to explore. So a lot of that information needs to be integrated and used to determine what the next step is going to be. As you go into your later development phase, you have data that comes from multiple dosages in the randomized trial. That those data need to be integrated, uh, comprehensively analyzed uh, for efficacy, safety, tolerability, uh, in order to capture, you know, those modifications, low-grade symptomatic toxicities, and we all get a good understanding of those and exposure relationships uh, to be able to make sure that you're identifying the right dose for patients. Um, right dose for patients, what does that really mean? I mean, once we go beyond the DLT window, you know, the DLT windows is really focused on, you know, really severe those limiting toxicities. But, you know, in the space of oncology where we have patients living much longer and we have treatments going for much longer uh, and we have patients expecting to actually, you know, live a normal life um, after being diagnosed and be, be, while being currently being treated on, on with, uh, with, with, with um, anti-cancer therapies, it's very important to start refocusing what our ideal tolerability means. For example, if you look at diarrhea, you know, we have the, the CTCAE approach of grading diarrhea, grade one all the way to grade five, and which grade five is there. Um, grade three to grade five is considered a dose limited toxicity. But if you look a little bit into more detail, on what each of these grades mean. You can see that these grades also pose a significant um, hurdle to patients. Grade two diarrhea is an increase in four to six stools per day over baseline. That results in very little opportunity to actually get, get to normal work. 
and this is the same for a lot of patients reporting symptomatic um, AEs as well, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, um, you know, a, a, as well. Those actually result in significant uh, patient issues. So looking beyond the DLT, safety events well beyond DLTs are responsible for a lot of tolerability issues. And these include low-grade symptomatic toxicities that really have a material impact on patients' quality of life. Uh, in a paper that was just published, I think about a month ago, by uh, Zuckerberg, uh, Jen Zuckerberg et al. in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, I've identified a number of a number of recently approved drugs, and you can see a number of those modifications. You know, for for these drugs, you know, the the, the drugs in white are small molecules, and the drugs in blue. Uh, large molecules, um, or specifically ADCs, and you can see that a lot of these toxicities, a lot of these dose modifications are due to toxicities that may or may not show up particularly in the DLT window. Another example of where you have tolerability issues is a drug called Selenexo, where you can find a high rate, high rates of dose modifications due to poor tolerability. And in, in this context, you know, a PMR was actually issued in order to, to study low to study lower doses. So what does that mean? Um, past future, informed drug development. You know, when developing drugs when developing drugs you really need to make those findings a priority and how do you do this you ensure that you have enough information to make informative decisions um, that additional information may need may require more patients and informative dose uh, it's going to require an integrative analysis of the risk benefit of the activity and safety issues um, it's going to require integrating a lot of more information that one expects oh i'm one and i'm done with and integrate the initial development process. How can I learn from this? What information is my preclinical, uh, my non-clinical data telling me about what's going to, what I'm going to see in the clinic? And what information is the data that I'm getting in the clinic telling me about my non-clinical uh, assessments? And how can I use that to learn, inform, and improve on, on our approach? And with that, I will pause um, to, to see um, to see proper. Um, Private has any questions or comments or thoughts? Very good. I think we are getting a few questions. So let me post this question to you. Um, it's a it's a more generalized question. Uh, if you can clarify the need for dose optimization, if the dose escalation data showed that there is a steep exposure response relationship for efficacy but a flat exposure response for safety, and I think the the uh, the question is, would it be required to expand to a, uh, to a lower dose, uh, which in case will probably doesn't add much to the safety, but might adversely impact efficacy? That's a very good process. question. And <laughs> that's a very good question. And I, I think one thing that's also, one thing that's very important to keep in mind is that uh, when we use the, the term exposure response for, for safety, that's a very reductive way of of, um, of of characterizing a very complicated approach for of safety, safety assessment. Um, safety is generally not necessarily always one thing. Um, you don't have that one safety event that you are concerned with. Sometimes the, you have that one safety event that you're concerned about. But more often than not, it ends up being more than one. It ends up being nausea and vomiting. Tox you know, it ends up being um, great, you know, neutropenia or thrombocytopenia. And it ends up being a lot more complicated than just one thing. Um, so saying that you have a flat exposure response for safety or maybe even a steep exposure response for safety where, you know, at no dose, there's, you know, at no dose, you also, you always have that safety effect. I think that's something that needs to be taken into um, significant account um, when do, when selecting what the optimal dose is, because um, every patient is going to be different, and every patient is going to evaluate, you know, the risk benefit of that safety event and that efficacy a lot um, a lot uh, differently as, as well. Um, is the extra is um, is there is the extra ten percent increased probability of of, of efficacy worth that? of what alternate 
um, safety events that is something that you will always be concerned about. So while you may say, okay, yeah, you have a flat exposure response for safety or a steep exposure response for, for efficacy, it's still very important to consider the totality of the information that you have before identifying what the optimal models is going to be. Yeah, no, it makes uh, uh, perfect sense. I mean, I think the what I heard, the underlying principle here is the optimizing uh, benefit risk. And um, I might extend that question, Dr. Kusania, and ask maybe um, the population that has been studied so far versus the population that will be studied in the next trial, as well as the population for which the drug will be marketed. That's probably an important consideration too, because how does the data at hand apply um, to the population that is going to going to be in the next uh, phases of, of development. Uh, any thoughts on that? Yes, that's a very good, that, that's a very good comment, and I think that you know uh, understanding where you're where you're kind of sort of going with your program is is very important. And generally, we found the particularly in oncology, we find that you know novel therapies start with really refractory uh, patients. And it gives us an opportunity to understand what the safety and some tolerability issues are um, in, in that population. But you also have to understand that some of those things carry over to other populations, whether you're looking at LAL lines and whether or not you are looking at other hematologic, other malignancies, be it solid tumors or, hemat or hematologic malignancies. And it's also important to know that some of them don't. Um, and an AE that an adverse event uh, that you see in hematology malignancies may not be as tolerable or as something that would be manageable in patients with solid tumors. So, so you have to think about what what can I learn from this and what can I not learn from this and be able to explore that space a little bit better. Yeah, this is definitely generating rich discussion here. So the follow on uh, that I received here, uh, it's a two part question. I'll ask the first part. Um, what if uh, I'm backfilling the subjects with a lower dose uh, to generate a good exposure response relationship for efficacy and safety? Is that uh, approach acceptable and reasonable uh, in lieu of a formal dose response study? Um, do, basically asking, do I need a formal dose response study or can I use uh, the data I have and generate data at a lower dose? Yes, that's an interesting question. I, I, I think that um, to a fair extent, um, one thing that we run into is a prophecy of information. And you know, there are lots of different ways to get information to be able to identify what the optimal dose is going to be. Um, I, I think one of the things that we will have to touch on here is that you know, there's no one size fits all. Um, approach to, to dose optimization. And there are numerous approaches that one can use to help inform what and get the information that they need. Um, one thing that we the one thing that is clear is that an MTD approach, you know, where you do basically a three plus three approach to, to identify what the max and, and go from there is, is not adequate. Uh, but it does present a lot of different opportunities to explore unique ways to to enrich the, the data that you need to make that to make that decision and backfilling is one way um backfilling to identify what the proper dose is or where your where your windows are yeah another way and then i think you know the fda is really welcomes these kinds of discussions to be able to understand how do you generate the information to make sure that you're able to adequately um develop these drugs to treat patients very good. Um, a lot of questions have come in, um, so I'll, I'll try to parse those. So let me uh, follow up on the last comment. Uh, when you get the package from uh, the, the companies around the dosing, um, how, how do you know something is adequate uh, that has is dose response being adequately characterized? What are some principles uh, one could one could follow? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good. That's 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 a, that's a good question. I, I think to a fair extent, one thing that you have to um, be sure about is that you know. Let me say, I think I might have a slide on of, of that there. So, um, I, how do you know that it's adequate? Well, to a fair extent, you know, um, 
a lot of the a lot of the information we try to look at the totality of the information that's provided to us by, by, by the company and one thing that we know and i think Pravin will agree with me on this is that good science brings good data which makes good which brings which results in good decisions um and i, I think that as a scientist you're not you're, you're not looking for the fda to grade your work right <laughs> um and, and, and so we look at it from the totality of the, of, of the information that's been provided to us. So we have to understand whether or not an adequate job has been done to inform uh, what the appropriate dose is for this population, for, for this population. And, you know, there are some instances where, you know, there are knowledge gaps and we try to reach out to be able to fill that information. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you just have to do another study to get that information. Now, you know, one thing that we found is that, you know, and I think, you know, from this slide I and going forward, one thing that we found is that, you know, when patients, when, when dosing is optimized for patients, it makes things a lot easier for the development program going forward. It makes, it, you don't run into, you know, you, you don't run into tolerability issues. You don't run into approvability issues. You don't run into post-marketing issues. Um, and it, 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 it makes better use of the patient's time, effort, and, you know, altruism in volunteering for a clinical study. You know, the last thing you want is for a patient to volunteer for a clinical study and have a poor outcome. Um, and, and so to a fair extent, we try to say that, you know, make sure that you do, the, the, you do your due diligence, whether or not you're going to be leveraging preclinical, not as you leverage a lot of the information that you develop to make sure that, you know, um, you've optimized the dose for the patient. Um, it's challenging to conduct this dose of optimization trials post-approval. Post post uh, and more often than not, we find that it's more efficient to evaluate, you know, this data and get this data more early in development as, as well. Wonderful. I think um, that's probably my favorite sentence of, of, uh, of our webinars is good science would lead to good data. And, you know, have you done your due, due diligence to understand? And at the end, I think I'm hearing it's both um, uh, art and science, uh, whether we have understood the, the, the risk benefit well. So what we'll do is we'll move on from here. Um, I think we'll go to case studies, uh, uh, Dr. Okusania. There are at least three questions I see. Uh, we can handle those into, um, into the uh, discussion session. Sure. So I, I think one of the things I was trying to take, uh, I was trying to help the, um, with the takeaway is that, is, is that those optimization is really best done pre-approval than, than post-approval, and, and an exam, and you know because post-approval presents unique challenges. So one case of is belantamab, right, which is an ADC that's currently that's currently approved for the treatment of patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma. And you know, if you look at a lot of their dose selection was based off um, a dream one, uh, a dream one, which was conducted in patients with relapsed refractory multiple myeloma, and they looked at a range of different doses. You can see that doses evaluated range from 0 0.03 all the way to 4.6, and the MTT was determined to be 3.4 milligrams per kilogram. Um, now, if you look at this data and look at the response rates, you can see that, you know, given the small number of patients here, uh, particularly the lower doses, it's really, really hard to be able to say that, and, you know, it's really, really hard to say that, you know, the, the optimal dose, you know, the optimal dose has been identified. Um, very few doses, lower doses were, were not explored, and um, higher trophic exposures were associated with higher rates of ocular toxicities. Um, this study actually uh, went on and evaluated two, two doses in their phase two clinic, in their phase two um, pivotal clinical study. Um, and they looked at the 2.5 milligrams per kilogram and the 3.4 milligrams per kilogram. And what they found was that, yes, you know, fatal AEs were slightly lower um, at the 2.5 versus the 3.4 versus 3.4. And there were lower frequencies of dose reductions and interruptions at, at lower dose. There were slightly lower frequencies of, you know, cornea toxicities at the lower dose as well. However, one thing that's important is one thing that we noted was that even at the lower dose of 2.5, there were still notable ocular toxicities 
Um, and because of that, you know, a PMR was issued uh, to be able to identify what the optimal dose for patients were in, in uh, for for um, for Belantum and Mapadota. So what what what's the takeaway from this? You know, the selection of a higher dose may result in a higher proportions of those modifications, reductions, interruptions, and discontinuations, not just in the registration or trial, but actually when it actually gets into the real world and, and you start treating patients. Uh, because of this, you know, post-marketing studies may, uh, for those things may be needed, which results in unique challenges post-marketing. Um, there are some instances where, you know, this is an instance where the drug was approved and the post-marketing study was issued, um, but poor optimization could also result in uh, a CI, could also result in a negative response from the agencies and a failure to bring uh, the drug to market. Um, so what if you do a post-marketing study? Well, post-marketing study, I think, you know, we very well know do have their challenges. Um, one example here is with ponatinib which is a TKI um, that, uh, with activity against BCR able, including the T3150, uh, uh, 315i mutations. Uh, the recommended dose is 45 milligrams once daily, and it was shown to have good response uh, in patients that are resistant or intolerant uh, in chronic phase CML. The, you know, the MTD was declared to be 45 milligrams, per, uh, 45 milligrams once daily. Um, however, you know, Additional information, once additional information came up about the drug, we found that it was poorly tolerated with you know, very frequent dose modifications and adverse events, uh, and ended up with a uh, more boxed warning about for arterial thrombosis and hepatotoxicity. Uh, a PMR, you know, was issued, you know, if you look at the dose response, exposure response for efficacy and for safety, you can see that with increased efficacy, with increased exposures, you have, you know, greater than 30 milligrams, you are at what appears to be a flat posh part of the exposure response curve. Um, with act with um, safety, you see, you know, increased risk for safety with expo with dose and increased risk of um, hypertension and grade three or higher practitioners. So, based on this data, a PMR was issued to evaluate um, alternate doses or a lower dose. Um, so, what did that show? You know, additional stuff follow up showed that you know ended up restricting the indications to patients with T315I mutations or for patients that with no for which no TKI was therapy was was indicated. And while a dose range study was conducted post-marketing, it took eight years to resolve the question about dosing around ponatinib, which is a very long time for patients. So how do you improve those organizations? Well, I'd say simple, but it's really not that simple, you know, but conduct it, consider the totality of the data, you know, PK, PD, activity or efficacy, safety and tolerability at each step. Evaluate your safety information beyond the DLTs. Incorporate your low-grade symptomatic toxicities, you know, those modification frequencies and patient-generated data for treatment-related symptoms. Identify your dose reach, your target dose reach early, and start exploring that, you know, exploring those several doses earlier, uh, ideally in randomized clinical trial, um, but, you know, there are all the alternative methods that, you know, may be able to provide a lot of that information earlier rather than later. And characterize your dose and exposure response for efficacy and toxicity early. Um, and basically what you can do with that is you can start updating it as you generate more information. Uh, one thing that we found that I've seen is that, you know, the exposure response analysis is not done until when it's time to submit for the NDE or PLA. And, and by then, you're already locked into a dose. You're already locked into an approach. If you start doing that early, it gives you a lot more flexibility to be able to, you know, modify, if necessary, any approach that you're trying to do. No one has the right to subject patients to unnecessary toxicities. If you can, if patients, if you can give a lower dose that's more tolerable, that's safer and get the same efficacy, or maybe even slightly lower efficacy, depending on the indication, you know, that is an option that should be made available for patients.
So what are my key points? Um, don't pursue an MTD approach with inadequate information. It's important to consider the totality of the data at each step of the dosage selection. And it's not just once daily or once weekly. Sometimes you need to be more innovative in, in your approach. Do I want to give it, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday? What's my clinical pharmacology rationale for doing that? What does my non-clinical data, what information do I have that may be able to, you know, provide more creative dosing approaches to improve tolerability and maximum, maximize clinical benefit for patients? Again, you know, one thing that I, I think you, you, you've heard a lot in this session is that, you know, no one size fits all. Um, flexibility is key. And as we've been very innovative in the space of oncology, in, in space of drug development for oncology products, also we encourage that um, for dose optimization and dose selection. And with that, I, I think, you know, the recipe for success, you know, <laughs> communicate, expect, you know, engage with the patients and the advocates, you know, leverage relationships in academics, and also reach out to regulators as we provide feedback and facilitate this interaction to be able to make sure that we are doing right for our patients. Very good. Thank you. Um, what we'll do, um, Amy, do you want to uh, summarize your uh, resources um, um, and then, then we can probably go back to questions? Sure. Uh, there are a number of uh, those optimization resources that the FDA has put out. Uh, and these have been you know, primarily with engagements with the FDA. You know, we have uh, multi stakeholder meetings that we've had, we've had publications. We actually just recently put out a paper, the one by Zuckerberg et al. in JCO. And, and also, you know, um, we have some guidance documents that have been put out there uh, that talk about those response and exposure response relationships. And all these informations are available for, to, for industry or to, to the general public to be able to inform that this is what we are thinking and this is our expectation on making sure that we have identified the optimal dose for, for patients being treated with oncology products. Very good. So number of questions have uh, come in. Uh, what I'll do is I'll try my best to kind of put them together. And um, um, Dr. Roxania, um, I love to hear, hear your opinion. So we'll continue on the on the topic of um, of what how to optimize that dose. Uh, and what what is what is needed? So the the first question that that came um, in continuing on the last discussion was. Uh, how do we reconcile putting more patients at lower dose, uh, possibly sub-efficacious dose in aggressive disease? Uh, yeah, we want to optimize the dose, but in aggressive disease, how do we justify we want to better understand the, the effect at the lower doses? That's a good, that's a good question, and that's a very important uh, conundrum that it seems like you are, that, that you're in. But the challenge of the, the, the question really ends up being really, you know, how do you know it's it, you're going to have some optimal uh, efficacy without actually having that information? If you have three patients uh, at the lower dose and one of them responds, responds you know, that's a 33% response rate. And, you know, versus a, you know, and you have two patients respond at the higher dose, that's, you know, 67% response rate. But the difference is just one patient. Um, so how do you know that that's actually suboptimal? You, one patient moved it from 33 to 67. Um, so I, I, I think that coming out, coming, coming to you with that, with that, with, with, with the mindset of saying, oh, I have to give the highest dose I can get away with. Um, if at the back end patients end up either having significant safety events that result in additional interventions or they end up having poorer outcomes because you know when they re when they remain on higher doses that result in longer toxicities um, ends up being a disservice because you haven't had the opportunity to explore lower doses to understand where the optimal dose is. Very good. Some questions have come up on the topic of totality of evidence. Um, uh, the, one of the question is uh, in terms of randomization. Um, 
do I need to randomize uh, uh, in a dose finding study or not randomizing is an option to understand dose response? That's a, that's a good question. And I think that, you know, as a, as, a, as a scientist, you have to ask yourself, what do you gain and what do you lose from randomization, right? Um, we all know what the benefits of randomizations are. Um, and, you know, you have to end, you end up with the data that you end up with, whether or not you randomize or not. Um, and you, we've seen examples uh, where, you know, you're evaluating two doses and the lower dose does better than the higher dose. And you're like, what's really going on there? But one, is it, you know, differences in tumor burden? Is it differences in the phase of the moon? Is it differences in their birth sign? Is it differences in um, all the patient-related characteristics? And quite frankly, it's really hard to tell. Um, so randomization does give you some information. Some does have its benefits. Um, however, you know, we can't say that everything has to be randomized because it does lead to some unique challenges as well. So I think it's very important to, to before you say, okay, I don't want to randomize, think about what will I be getting from a randomization approach or what will I be losing from that approach and, and, um, <laughs> and make the best decision. Very good. Continuing on the totality of evidence, I think so far um, um, this uh, the topic has been focused on uh, the evidence for this drug. But an interesting question has come up. Um, what's the value of looking at the trial design or endpoints for other products within, let's say, similar indications, similar mechanism of action? Um, can I use that uh, to, to justify my uh, understanding of dose? And um, how, how do I incorporate that into, into my strategy? So, um... That's a good. That's that's a good question, and I think um, from from that approach, I, I think it's important to think about, um, you know, this 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 idea that everyone is unique and special, <laughs> um, but really um, every snowflake every snowflake is unique and special, uh, <laughs> but it's still snow, uh, so to speak. <laughs> so to so, so to speak. Um, and you know, being in this space for 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 uh, for, a fair, for for a fair bit, one thing that we one thing that we can't ignore is information. And you know, it really depends on how you weigh the information. Um, you can't pretend that you know the next. Um, you can't pretend that say BTK inhibitors, but uh, Burkitt's types and kindness inhibitors have not been explored before. You can't pretend that say there's no information on that. However, your drug is still unique and it's still different and it's still separate and apart from all those other um, approved products. So yes, you know, there are some information that there is some, if there is some benefit from learning from the approaches of others, but you still have to understand that your drug is still different. Um, if it's not, then why are you even studying it? And so you have to leverage the information that you know, others have generated, um, leverage, generate your own information and figure out where your drug fits in. Um, a good example of this is, I, I think, you know, um, is, um, what's the word, um, is the first approved um, bispecific, right, um, Blincyto. And that drug has got approved and that drug has been, there's a lot of publications on it. And that a lot of that information has been leveraged into developing additional bispecific agents. Too. So let's not. So I, I think it's important to understand what has gone before, leverage a lot of that information, but also make sure you are generating sufficient information to support what your drug, what your what the dosage of your drug is going to be. Very good. Yeah, I like that. Um, a snowflake at the end is snow, and in fact, generally we stay away from product in this uh, webinars but uh, one of the products we created is exactly to do that is to gather as much information possible uh so ria allows you to do that in terms of incorporating trial design endpoints and extract it easily so again a lot of discussion has has come in on the same topic so i'll continue um i think these two questions are um very related um that 
when we are basically developing a drug and there is a standard of care, uh, do we need to optimize the standard of care dosing as well? Because at the end, it's a combination. And the similar question has come, uh, what if I'm going from a population to population? Would we be optimizing that dosing in each population? So um, standard of care questions um, uh, end up being challenging um, because we already know that this is an approved standard of care. So when you are adding your drug to an approved standard of care, um, the first thing that you want to think about is best, you know, don't, first do no harm, right? <laughs> uh, if a patient is going to get a certain amount of benefit from, 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 from the standard of care, you know, the first thing you want to do is not mess that up. Um, if the response rate is going to be 80% uh, and you're going to add on your, your drug, and you don't want to drop down to 72. You don't want to drop down to reduce that probability. So the first thing that you want to do is preserve the activity and preserve the safety for, for, that, for that standard of care. And so um, with that in mind, you need to make sure that when you're optimizing your drug, um, when you're optimizing the, 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 the dosage regimen, right, uh, you need to make sure that given that you are the new guy on the block, given that you are the innovator, um, that adding all your drugs is not making things worse. Um, whether or not you want to start fine-tuning the standard of care, I, I think that's a conversation I need to have with the, F, with the FDA, um, because in addition to you know, what's approved in, in the label, we know that you know, there are also certain approaches that, you know, that are within the, the, bre the, um, the breadth of um, patient-related clinical practice too. So I, I think that, you know, it's that, I, I think that that's a conversation that is worth having with the, with the division prior to messing around with um, what, you know, clinical, manage, clinical um, management is supposed to look like. Yep. So I'll go up a little bit. Uh, some questions had come in earlier that I tabled. One question has come up, uh, you know, traditional uh, way of dose finding is three plus three study design. Um, some newer approaches have been presented like Bayesian optimal interval design. I'll modify that question a bit. Um, have you seen uh, application of that? Uh, how, how best to utilize these newer study designs for um, uh, for dose optimization? Oh, yes. Um, I think that to a fair extent, um, a lot of these um, newer approaches are something that are very, that we are very interested in. And we really welcome a lot of engagement on, on, on that. And to the, to the question of the 3.3 design, I, I think that is a, um, that in my opinion, I, I think really should end up being a flaw. <laughs> it's really just a, a starting point. Um, something that is simplification of an approach to identify what the proper dose is going to be. And when you start with the 3.3 design, you don't necessarily have to end up in the 3.3 design. Um, it really just takes you to a space where you're able to identify where activity is and start doing proper dose optimization. Uh, more often than not, you find a triple street design gives you to a place where you're going to do a randomized, you know, phase two study. Um, but because of how rapidly drug development moves in oncology, um, sometimes it's worth uh, exploring additional approaches to make sure that you identify the proper windows of activity to understand where this, uh, the, yeah, identify the proper windows of activity. Yeah. Um, an interesting question that also came up earlier in terms of the preclinical to clinical uh, translation. Um, and uh, the question is generally, you know, we have difficulty translating efficacy and safety from um, preclinical to clinical. So what, what role does uh, preclinical data play into um, a project uh, in kind of defending the dose uh, uh, through uh, for Project Optimus? So preclinical data does play a role in supporting your, 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 your doses. Um, you know, as clinical pharmacologists, we look at the entire spectrum of drug development. We, we are not just limited to, you know, what the clinical information uh, gets us. We're also looking at, 
you know, um, other approaches to make sure that we are having proper target engagement. We're looking, we're incorporating variability in our assessments to be able to understand that this is really what's going on. And, and, and I think to a fair extent, that's our role. Now, um, with clinical, with preclinical um, information, once we, if, an example is where you have situations where, you know, they're off target, you know, they're off site targets. Uh, understanding what that exposure is, understand how that translates to clinical outcomes, understanding how that translates to your dosing regimen, understanding how that translates to uh, receptor regeneration or receptor cycling. Um, those are those are examples of ways where non-clinical information help you in your clinical development program. And really, what you see in your clinical development program informs back to your non-clinical data and helps you understand or put it into proper context. Gives a little bit more what you call um, wiggle room or or or, or, or um, weighting on on the data that you get from your non-clinical models. Very good. The next set of questions, there are actually two questions came in. One specifically quoted an example that you presented, Belentumab, but I think I'll stay away from the specifics of the example in asking this question uh, because this, a different question touches upon the same topic of small sample size in early studies. Um, uh, generally, these decisions are made based on small, small sample sizes. Um, and uh, and even you mentioned right uh, when you move from one dose to another when you have sm a small sample size one patient difference may seem like 50 percent increase but may not be true so the two set of questions that are common is in terms of um, um again i'll paraphrase it but should we continue that dose evaluation dose finding in larger studies and a, a related question to them is then does when we have small sample size is it more advantageous to do randomization? Um, so, um, small sample sizes do pro do present a challenge, um, and generally, you know, when you're moving away from small sample sizes of six um, to small sample sizes of ten, small sizes of, of twenty, um, it, it, it becomes better. <laughs> Um, but it still does result in, in those kind of challenges as well. I, I think to a fair extent, depending on where you are in your exposure or dose response at evaluations, and we're looking at the totality of the information, um, it, it's important to know that you need, uh, you need a little bit of resolution on what your estimates are. And, and that really should help drive where you're going with regards to how many patients you should have in each cohort, so to speak. Um, you know, there are some drugs that it's fairly clear, it's very straightforward, you know, you know, you're getting ridiculously high response rates and it's fairly consistent. Um, yeah, fine, you know, um, that's one of, you know, the approach that you take in that regard would be something would be totally different that than a drug where you're getting really noisy response rates. You know, one, you know, one dose, one at one dose you're getting 40%, and another dose you're getting 60, and another dose you're getting 22. Uh, in that instance, it behooves you uh, to get a little bit better clarity or better resolution on where your point estimates of your responses are so that you make sure you're selecting the right dose. Um, you are taking that information, you're looking at your non-clinical information, so what's really going on here? Why am I getting these kind of responses? What's the cause of my dose modification and my dose discontinuations and my tolerability issues? And in, in that context, you know, you're asking yourself, if I have 14 patients and I go up to 2,000, 200 patients, is my point estimate going to go up or going to go down or is it just going to settle down? Um, and, and those are questions that you have to ask yourself as you <laughs> figure out whether or not you want, how much, how more patients do you need? 30, 60, 100? <laughs> it's, it's a discussion that you have to ask. Yeah. Perfect. Next uh, two questions I'll combine. They're pretty loaded, um, Dr. Okusania, because they're getting to the, the basic philosophy of what is Project Optimus trying to do or what, what is the right way of, uh, of um, those selection dose optimization. So I'll kind of paraphrase both. But the first question says, basically, 
one approach is to one size fits all to find one size fits all other size other way is to find um right as you said uh, uh, according to larry's definition um uh, right dose right patient right time that requires understanding into individual variability and really defining subpopulation so uh, i'll paraphrase the other question also but i think this um uh, uh, attendee would like to know is the one size fits all not a right way but um, fda is trying to move to more really individualized dosing is the undercurrent and the second question related to that is uh, pre-optimus people used to say that i need to design a study to identify the dose to be carried forward in the next study and now project optimus or the clinical pharmacology way depending on where you cut the uh, the line in terms of when the dosing discussion started is I need to design a study to identify the exposure response so I didn't I can identify a reasonable dose to um, uh, to be carried forward in in the drug development program so do you agree uh, with the question number one project optimus is trying to move away from one size fits all and with the question number two um, is um, that you know uh, defining exposure response is an appropriate way um, of thinking about this new way of thinking about those. It's, it's well loaded philosophical, but I think so, I see the audience is really engaged in this. Yeah, so you weren't kidding when you said that those are loaded questions. <laughs> so um, let me let me do let me handle the the uh, the latter question first. Um, so to a fair extent, right? Um, the, the impression of, oh, my best in human study is to identify the best do the dose that I'm going to take to my next study. That is a unique perspective. And I think that if that perspective is something that was shared within the FDA, um, we have been disabused of that. Because while, while the impression is we're going to identify the dose that's going to be evaluated in our next study, um, that those as poorly selected as it ends up being, ends up being what ends up going out to patients. And, and so um, that's problematic. And because of that, you gotta say, okay, wait, when you're developed, given how rapidly um, oncology drug development is going and how you have, you know, end of phase one, phase one studies ending up as your pivotal clinical study <laughs> for approval, um not doing a good job identifying the proper dose for patients is going to is a problem and you really and that's really need to stop <laughs> so if, if you're going to benefit from a streamlined um drug development program where we don't really have phase one phase two phase three clinical studies anymore in in you know quality where it's really early phase versus late phase <laughs> um and you know clinical studies to explore exploratory clinical study and clinical studies to support a regulatory decision um it's important for you to figure out the best way to identify what the proper dose is going to be if this study is going to support your approval so it's kind of like a mind shift and it's kind of like if you're going to shift uh, it's, it's, it's a mind shift that really needs to go pervade back into in, into the, the way you're actually thinking about oncology drug development. Um, to the first, and, uh, sorry, go ahead. To the first question, I, I think that, you know, uh, precision, you know, individualized medicine is something that's very important, uh, you know, in oncology. And I think to a fair extent, we've tried uh, to, to, to ensure that. If identifying the optimal dose uh, ends up identifying the right dose for the right patient and incorporates it, incorporates all the in the individual variability and all the things that you've talked about. That's great, um, uh, but it's important to know that you know this is a space where innovation is welcome, and this is the space where you know identifying you know the proper uh, this is the way I, and identifying the, the proper approach for patients is is, is something that we, is, we strongly encourage and we're willing to engage on all kinds of um, innovative ways of, um, of of dosing perfect and my apologies to folks who have put in questions we cannot get to all the questions i think dr okisania this generated a lot of discussion we'll have to figure out 
how to follow up with these questions, including a lot of my questions I wanted to ask about guidance, how does Project Optimus works with um, accelerated approval, but this was a wonderful session. Uh, and it's always good to connect with um, with XFDA colleagues. And um, with that, I would like to thank you for your time and uh, thought-provoking discussion. Uh, for our next webinar, um, we're gonna have another XFDA uh, coming up uh, with, to talk to us about role of clinical pharmacologist in setting up regulatory strategy. Um, as a part of this, you're, uh, feel free to register it, as well as you will see a poll uh, that will appear on, on, your, on your screen. If you can answer how likely you are to recommend Vipro's webinar to your colleagues, we would really appreciate it. This allows us to uh, form, uh, understand what content is more important uh, to you all. Thanks for joining everyone. Dr. Okisania, thank you very much again for joining us in October. And See you all in November. Uh, thank you.